Let us pray. Our Father who is in heaven, we thank you once again for the opportunity to have another Bible study. It's our desire to appreciate your power over death, that we may be able to have eternal life. We plead, Lord in heaven, for understanding and an appreciation of the truths that you want us to appreciate at this time. We plead for your Holy Spirit. And we plead for faith to grasp your promises. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. It's a village in the English country and the children are rushing to and fro in the street. The shoe cobbler is examining his final product. The marketplace is a beehive of activity. It's all business as usual until the sound of a specific bell is heard. Suddenly everybody stands still. All voices are hushed and men remove their hats. Everybody understands what has just happened. Someone has died. The sounding of the bell that announced someone's death is called a death knell. With that picture of the village still portrayed on the canvas of your mind, I ask this question. When will we hear death's death knell? When shall it be announced that death has died? To understand this, we need to look at an incident when a friend of Jesus died whilst he was still here on earth. In John 11 verse 1 to 4 it says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified thereby. Continues. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that saith he to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. Now notice a few points. Lazarus, Jesus' close friend, was very sick. Now Jesus was informed of his friend's sickness, but instead of rushing there immediately, he remained stationed for two more days. Then later Jesus decided that it was time to go to Judea, the province where Lazarus was. The story continues in verse 11 to 14. This thing said he, after that he said unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he asleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Notice something. Jesus made it clear that his purpose was to go and attend to Lazarus. Jesus knew of Lazarus' death before being told of anyone. The last time news came from Bethany, it was that Lazarus was sick. This is in John 11 verse 6. After that, there is no news that came from Bethany, and, and yet we hear Jesus saying that Lazarus was dead. He knew of this without being informed by anyone. Now, Jesus declared plainly that when Lazarus was dead, he described it as sleep. And so, beloved, to Jesus, those who die in him are only sleeping. Let us look at a few more examples to prove this point. We go to Acts 7 verse 60 and there we find the death of Stephen. And these are the words that describe his final moments. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And we had said this, he fell asleep. And so clearly, this is describing the death of Stephen and it is described as him falling asleep asleep. That's not the only example. We have David in 2 Samuel 7 verse 12 where it says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. And so once again, we find the case that when you die in Jesus, you sleep. The story of Lazarus' death continues with verse 17. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave for four days already. 
So by the time Jesus arrived in Bethany, Lazarus had been buried for four days. He was, for all intents and purposes, very dead. Upon his arrival, news was carried to Martha that Jesus was there, after which she went out to meet him, and she confessed that he was still Lord and able to perform a miracle. John 11, verse 23 to 24, then says, Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And so in response to a statement of faith, when she still called Jesus Lord, Jesus spoke to her words of encouragement. And Jesus promised that Lazarus was going to live again. And Martha makes it clear that her faith at that time was not focused on the immediate resurrection of Lazarus, but rather she was looking forward to his resurrection at the last day, as the verse says. Now, herein is where our study gets interesting. Martha had faith in the resurrection of Lazarus at the last day. When is this last day? How does this resurrection take place? This resurrection that Martha was looking forward to when Lazarus would arise in the last day. What evidence was there for her to pin her hopes on her brother rising at a future date? And do we have more evidence of such a hope? Well, we'll look at two examples of Job and Paul as they spoke of the last day. In Job 14 verse 10 to 12, Job speaks and says, But man dieth and wasteth away, yea, man giveth up the ghost. And where is he? As the waters fail from the sea, and the flood decayeth and drieth up, so man lieth down and riseth not, till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. So here we find in the book of Job, we are being told that once a man dies, he shall sleep and not awake until the heavens be no more. Very interesting. But the passage continues. Or oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret until thy wrath be past, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Thou shalt call and I will answer thee. Thou wilt have a desire to the work of thine hands. Powerful, powerful passage, deep, deep faith, strong, strong hope. This hope, this faith can be ours. Now let's take a closer look at what Job was actually saying and hoping for. And the lessons that we can learn. Remember, Job was the first book that was written in the, all the Bible. It was written by Moses even before Genesis. So the passage you are studying here was known by the Hebrews throughout their time and even Mary. And Martha knew about this passage. And the light that is therein was light to them and gave hope to them. And so we notice from the passage we've read that Job longed for death, where he would be kept hidden secretly until God's wrath was passed. Job knew that if he was to die and be buried, there would be a set time, a future time, when he was to be remembered and he would be called out of the grave. He also knew that after he died, he would not live again until that specific appointed time when his change would come. That set time would take place when the Lord would call him and Job would come back to life because he would answer the Lord's call. This takes place after the heavens are passed away. Because remember, the Bible tells us that Job believed that you would remain in the grave and you would not awake until the heavens pass away. So it is only after the heavens pass away when all these things take place, after God's wrath is passed, it will be a set time when he shall be called out of the grave and he shall hear the Lord call him. Only then shall he come out of the grave. The example of Job proves that faith of the resurrection at the last day existed among God's people long before Lazarus and Martha were even born. Let us consider this faith years after Lazarus' death. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 6 to 7 says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. These are the words of Paul nearing his death. Paul was talking about his imminent death and how he had been faithful to the very end of his life. The passage continues in verse 8. 
Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me that day, and not me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. After speaking of his expectant death, he then looks forward to that crown that he would receive at a future date after his death. On that future date after his death, Jesus would give him a crown. Not only would Paul receive the crown on that specific day, but all those that loved the thought of Christ's second coming. Clearly, that day when the crown would be given would also include Job. This means Job would also receive a crown at that appointed time which Paul spoke of. Because that is the time that Job would be looking forward to the second coming of his Lord as we discovered in Job chapter 14. Now, when shall this event take place? When is this moment when the Lord shall call? At what point do we find the saints being called up together to receive a crown? When will Job be called from the grave and receive his crown together with Paul and all others who look forward to the second coming of Christ? We find this in 1 Peter 5 verse 4 says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Jesus is the chief shepherd, and he shall come again. All saints that died shall receive the individual reward of a crown, but this shall be done collectively at a single event, at the second coming of Christ. Notice another passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 to 14. It says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. As much as Jesus died and rose again, so also those who sleep in Christ, those that died having surrendered their lives to him, those shall also resurrect as Jesus resurrected. The passage continues. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. When Jesus comes again, there will be living believers on the earth. These shall not prevent the dead believers from inheriting eternal life, because these dead believers who are described as sleeping shall rise again when Jesus shall shout with the voice of the archangel. This is the time that Job referred to when he said, If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Thou shalt call. And so this call that Job looked to is being described as the Lord giving the trump of the trumpet shout of the archangel. And Job looked at that moment and he says, And I will answer thee, thou shalt have a desire to the work of thine hands. Job 14 verse 14 to 15. Very clear. This is the very time that Martha looked forward to when she said, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection on the last day. John 11 verse 24. It is also the same time that Paul and Peter testify that all the saints shall receive their crowns on a specific day at the last day, at the second coming of Christ. 2 Timothy 4 verse 8 and 1 Peter 5 verse 4. All this shows that when one dies in Jesus, you do not go anywhere. But you remain asleep in the grave until Jesus comes again to raise up all those who died in him. Only then will he take them to heaven. And not only them, but all those who will be alive at the time of his second coming. 2 Thessalonians 4 verse 17. As we saw earlier in Job 14 verse 13, Job longed to be hidden in the grave. To be allowed to sleep there until his resurrection when Jesus returns. The logical questions one may then ask would be, what is it like to be waiting in the grave? In what condition will we find ourselves between the moment that we die and the day we resurrect when Jesus returns? Very interesting questions, and the Bible answers them. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 to 6 says, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them 
is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. The dead cannot affect anything that happens on earth. They have no influence whatsoever upon daily events. Their feelings, their hatred, their affections are gone. Their thinking capacity comes to an end. They have nothing to do with anything that is under their sun. Their knowledge perishes. That is the state of those who are asleep. There is more evidence. Psalm 115 verse 17 says, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. So not only do dead people cease to have anything to do with humanity, anything that is under the sun, they also have nothing to do with the things of God. Because it says the dead praise not the Lord. So dead people cannot praise God. God. So it is not possible that dead people are, are able to pray, that dead people are able to worship, that dead people are able to sing. They have nothing to do with the praise of God. Once someone is dead, they are dead. They have nothing to do with humanity. They have nothing to do with anything under the sun. And they have nothing to do with the things of God. For the dead praise not the Lord. Isaiah 38 verse 18 says the same thing and adds that those who are in the grave cannot hope in God's truth. Psalm 6 verse 5 repeats the same thought. Now, why can they not worship God and hope in his truth? Because their thoughts perished the day that they had died. We saw this in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 to 6. To many this sounds shocking for it goes against the commonly held belief that there is a part of man that continues to exist after his death. That after someone dies, there is a part of them that continues to think, to feel. There's a part of them that can continue to worship God in one way or another. There's a part of them that can communicate with God on behalf of those who are still living. All this is contrary to the Bible truth we're about to see. Almost every religion on earth teaches that after death, some part of man continues to be conscious in this state or another state, and in one place or another. But consciousness in death is a generally believed and accepted teaching, but if the Bible is allowed to speak plainly, a different picture is presented. What happens when we die can be more easily appreciated when we understand that the condition of man and beast at death is exactly the same. Shocking, but true. Notice in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 18 to 21, it says, I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them, and that they may see that they themselves are beasts. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. So, whatever happens to men also happens to animals. Even one thing befalleth them, as one dieth, so dieth another. So, the way that man dies is exactly the same way that animals die. Yea, they have one breath. So not only do they die the same, but the breath that is in man is also the breath that is in animals. They all have one breath. The Bible continues. So that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go unto one place. All are of the dust, and all tend to dust again. So when a man dies, he goes to a certain place. The same place that animals go to when they die. The Bible says they all go to one place. For they are dust and all tend to dust again. There is no difference. Man and beast have the same destination at death. The Bible continues. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Ends with a question. So we have seen that we die exactly the same way as cows die. And they go to the exact same place that we go when we die. If a man goes to heaven or hell or any other after death state, then dogs have to be there as well. But we have seen that we return to the dust, not only us, but the animals as well. Cows and all other animals have the same breath as men, as we have studied. It is that breath that gives both men and animals the ability to live. In Ecclesiastes 3 verse 21, a rhetorical question is asked concerning the spirit of man and beast, of which the answer is provided elsewhere. But before we look at the answer, let us consider a few other questions. What exactly is the spirit of man and the spirit of beasts? What is this spirit? How is this spirit related to the one breath that they both have? Remember, we read that 
man and beast have the same breath. What's the relationship with this, between this same breath and the spirit of man and beast in the passages that we've just read? The answer is found in looking at and understanding how man was created in the very beginning. In Genesis 2 verse 7 it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so God formed man from the dust. This shows that at some point God collected dust and caused it to form the shape and structure of a man, but it was lifeless. Only then did God breathe into the nostrils of this lifeless form, upon which it came to life and became a living soul. Before these two elements combined, man could not think, feel, or act. Man was not alive. Man did not exist as a living being. It was just dust on the ground in the form of a man, and the breath of life was with God. Separately, the dust could not think, feel, and act. Neither could the breath of life think, feel, and act. The two have to be together for men to be alive and to be able to think, feel, act, worship, etc. Therefore, a living soul is dust plus the breath of life. When these two elements are separated, there is no existence of any soul. There is no thought, there is no feeling, there is no action. Only when these two are together, dust plus breath of life, do we have a living soul? Do we have feelings? Do we have thinking? Do we have worship? Only then are we in existence. And so we find in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 19 to 20, as we have just read, it shows that both man and beast have the same breath of life, and both came from dust. Hence, even animals become living souls when God combined dust and gave them the breath of life. And so as man became a living soul when God combined dust and breathed into that dust for man to come into existence so two animals as well are made from dust and god has given them the breath of life for them to also become living souls and the bible is clear about this let's go to genesis 7 verse 21 to 22 to elaborate on this point and the bible says and all flesh died that moved upon the earth both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. And so the Bible tells us that every class of animal life that was on the land, yet not in the ark, was declared to have died in the flood. And this list included human beings. All these creatures, both men and animals, were declared to have the breath of life. That breath of life, that spark of life that is found in living human beings and keeps them alive is also found in dogs and keeps them alive as well. There is no difference. Inasmuch as man was declared to be a living soul when the form of dust was given the breath of life, so other creatures are living souls because they too are made of dust and the breath of life. Let's consider a passage in Numbers 31 verse 28. And it says, and levy a tribute unto the Lord of the men of the war which went out to battle. One saw of every 500, both of the persons and of the beeves, beeves are oxen, and of the asses, asses are donkeys, and of the sheep. Now, here we find God is very clear. It says one soul of every 500. And then the Bible gives us a description of the different classes of creatures wherein we are to take one soul of 500 and these creatures are all described as souls because it says one soul of 500 of persons of oxen of dog of donkeys of sheep one soul of 500 so one soul of 500 persons were to be given as tribute one soul of 500 oxen were to be given as tribute one soul of 500 donkeys one soul of 500 sheep it is clear that god referred to both man and animals as souls in short in the context of our study you do not have a soul you are a living soul you are a living being and so is your pet dog because you both are made of dust and you have the breath of life which came from God. But there is a difference between man and animals. 
In Genesis 1 verse 26 to 28, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God created man in his likeness, in character, in form, and in his faculties. That is, God can plan ahead, he can reason, he has creative qualities, he discerns between right and wrong, so does man. But man has this on a miniature level. This cannot be applied to animals. God also gave man dominion over creation, including animals. That too is another difference between man and beast. Job 35 verse 11 says, Who teacheth us more than the beasts of the earth, and maketh us wiser than the fowls of heaven? So, God teaches us more than the beasts and the birds. He has put in us a knowledge of something that other creatures on earth do not know, nor can they comprehend. In our first presentation to the unknown God, we looked at Ecclesiastes 3.11 and we saw that man has an inbuilt desire to worship. This desire to worship, this knowledge of a bigger being that is unseen and that created the heavens and the earth, this inbuilt desire and knowledge is absent in animals, this desire to worship. Also to know that though man was made in the image of God, there are fundamental differences between God and man. Here are just two examples. One, whilst God is spirit, according to 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17, a human being is flesh. We are told this in Genesis 2 verse 23. God also is the only one with immortality, 1 Timothy 6 verse 16. And man also is mortal, Job 4 verse 17. So there are differences. We have seen that both men and animals are living souls, living beings. We have also seen differences between these two orders of creatures. Let us consider the relationship between the breath of life and the spirit. So we have noticed, in short, that both men and beast have the same breath of life. We have noted that both men and beast are living souls. And so we now want to understand what is this spirit Job 27 verse 3 says, All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. So the Bible is telling us that whilst I am alive, my breath is in me. Whilst I am alive, the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. But remember, in Genesis 2 verse 7, God breathed into Adam's nostrils. So already we find the first evidence that the breath that is in me is the breath that God breathed in me. But it is also described as the spirit of God that is in my nostrils. Notice Isaiah 42 verse 5 where it says, Thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. And so it's clear that the context of what we are covering right now. The breath of life is the same as the Spirit of God in our nostrils. I keep emphasizing in our context because there's other instances where the soul represents something else and the Spirit of God is something else. But within our current context, the breath of life is the Spirit of God, which is the spirit or ability that God has given man and beast to be alive. It came from God and it belongs to God. It is not the same as the Holy Spirit who is the third person of the Godhead as we studied in our sixth presentation, The Sinners Make Over. So the rhetorical question asked in Ecclesiastes 3.21 can be answered to show that the spirit of man and the spirit of beast are both the breath of life, the spirit of God who gave it. So what really happens when a person dies? Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7 says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. The dust returns to the earth, and the spirit, which is the breath of life, shall return to God. As we discovered earlier, the dust could not think, 
could not feel and could not act without the breath of life. And the breath of life, which in this context is the spirit, could not think, feel, or act before being combined with the dust. This shows that at death, when these two elements of dust and breath of life are separate, we cannot think, we cannot feel, we cannot act. We know nothing, and we have nothing else to do with that which takes place under the sun. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5 to 6. Now, my brothers and my sisters, this may seem as a depressing and heavy topic because we have loved ones who died and who are dying. We also are subject to death. It is a heartbreaking and sobering reality of life. And to the majority, the thought of death will bring a heavy cloud above our heads. This current state of affairs is not the way that Jesus designed things to be. Man was meant to live forever and death is an invader, but where did death come from? Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Death came as a result of sin. When there is no sin, there is no death. And when there is sin, there is death. Romans 3 verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore everyone should die. And as we all know, everyone is subject to death. Even as you listen to this or watch this, you may have had a near-death experience or this may be one of the last sermons you might hear before you die. It might be one of the last sermons that I present before I die because death knocks at anyone's door at any moment. It's a sad reality. Now let's glean more truth from the scriptures. Ezekiel 8 and verse 20. We keep seeing the truth that sin is what brings death. The verse says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. So the Bible tells us very clearly that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. The soul, as we have seen, the soul is the living being, or person that sins shall die. There is no such thing as in an immortal soul. The Bible is clear. The soul, the living being, the person that sins shall die. There is no immortal part or there is no immortal soul within man. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Thankfully, we praise God that he did not leave us to our own ruin. We're destined for death because we have all sinned, but God has made adequate provision for each individual to live forever. God wants us to live. He has no pleasure in the death of any of us. Ezekiel 33 verse 11 says, Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? That is the voice of a pleading God who is pained and does not want us to die. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Even the death of the worst of the brutal dictators or thugs or blasphemers, their death does not bring him any pleasure. He wants us to live, but he explains that the condition for eternal life is that we turn from our evil ways. This can only be done by repenting and confessing our sins to Jesus, who takes them away from us. For he is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. John 1 verse 29. Romans 6 verse 23. Again. For the wages of sin is death. We've seen that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And we've also seen that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And thus the verse continues to say, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus our Lord. Death is the inevitable result of what we have earned because of our sins. God graciously offers us the gift of eternal life, which is something we do not deserve. This gift is only accessible through Jesus Christ. Now, let's return back to the starting story when Jesus raised up his friend Lazarus. John 11, verse 25 to 26. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? That is why when Lazarus had died, Martha was able to 
rightfully hope in a dead brother rising again because Lazarus had accepted this free gift which is found in Jesus Christ alone. When the child of God breathes her last, she is asleep, awaiting the resurrection. At that time, when Jesus comes again, she will receive the crown from her Lord. The prostitute with full blown aids, the tribalist who murdered in Rwanda, or who murdered in Gukura Hundi, or the racist police officer in America who shot dead an innocent black teenager, or the stealing shopkeeper, or the lying child, all sinners of all colors, shapes, and sizes, if we accept Jesus, when we breathe our last, we will only be sleeping and waiting for the resurrection. Believest thou this? To those who believe in Jesus, death is but a sleep, for they shall rise again. That is why Jesus was able to say that those who believe in him shall never die. Today, Jesus still feels our grief our sorrow, our pain, when we lose one who is dear and close to us just as he did at Lazarus' funeral. Not only does he feel our pain when we grieve and mourn, but in every other disappointment, trial, and moment of sadness, he partakes of our sorrows. He is still full of tender pity of the human family as we are told in Hebrews 4 verse 15. Now, there are important parallels between the experience of Lazarus and what we experience today. Jesus wept at Lazarus' funeral, and he is still touched by our grief today, and he will address it just as he addressed it in the day of Lazarus. He shall call all his sleeping saints from the grave when he comes the second time, just as he called Lazarus from the grave. But there is a difference between our experience and the experience of Lazarus. Unlike Lazarus who was resurrected to again sleep the sleep of death once more, Jesus will resurrect his sleeping believers to the experience and reality of eternal life, never more to die. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52 to 54 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. To the saints, to those who believe in Jesus, this is when death shall die. The Bible shows us clearly that when Jesus shall come again, he shall give a loud shout with the shout of the archangel, with the trumpet of God to the believers. This loud shout shall be death's death now. Do you want to be part of those who will respond to this resurrection call? Do you desire the assurance of eternal life, though you may breathe your last at any moment? Then, why not surrender your life to Jesus Christ? Ask him to come into your heart and take charge of every sphere of life. Remember, it's your choice. The Bible says in 1 John 5 verse 11, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. I encourage you, my brother and my sister, please choose life. Please choose Jesus. Accept him. Surrender to him and he will give you the hope of eternal life. No matter what happens in our life right now, even if we die, we will die in the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the best gift we can give to those who are around us is a knowledge of Jesus for them to accept Jesus so that when they die, when they rest, they will rest in Christ and they will rest with the knowledge of being resurrected again. And if they die in Christ and we die in Christ, the parting may be painful now, but we will die and we will part in the hope that we shall sleep in the grave and we shall resurrect again and meet when Jesus Christ comes a second time, when he shall bring all the dead from the grave, who those who believed in him and those who are alive and believe in him shall be caught up together and they shall receive their crown with Jesus and shall be with him forever. That is the greatest gift that we can give. Please choose life and help others to choose life. If this is your desire, 
then let us pray and thank God for the gift of eternal life that he has given us in Jesus Christ. We are praying. Our Father in heaven, we all face the reality of death. At any moment, we can die. And even now, Lord, as this study has been presented, um, there is a pandemic that's wiping out many people. Millions have been infected and hundreds of thousands are dead. And the death toll continues to rise. But not only from the corona pandemic, but many other diseases, accidents, wars, hunger, poverty are taking place and claiming many people's lives. There's violence. And we are all uh, acquainted with the reality of death. It's a painful process, Lord. And Lord, we really are thankful for this study that gives us hope that death will not have the final say. One day death shall die. One day we shall uh, see the end of death in our lives. And we can only experience this as we accept you. There are others, I believe and pray, who have accepted you, who have accepted the life that you offer, who are accepting this gift of eternal life. I pray, Lord, that you may accept them, and that you may strengthen them, and that you may keep them faithful until the very last day, that you may keep me, as well as all others who have already accepted you, that you may help us to be faithful until the very end, so that when our life on earth comes to an end, we may rest in the grave and you may raise us up to receive the crown of life. We also pray, Lord, for many others who are still in the land of darkness, who are still uh, susceptible to death and yet have not yet accepted you as Lord and Savior. Please, Lord, let this message of hope go out to them that they may receive hope, that they may receive the promise of eternal life. We thank you for giving us Jesus. We thank you for the assurance of victory over death. We thank you, Lord in heaven, for your goodness to us. In the name of Jesus, I pray all these things. Amen. For further reading, please read chapter 58 in the book Deserve Ages. The title is Lazarus Come Forth. It's a powerful and a wonderful read. There's also the book Great Controversy. We will keep emphasizing this book. It's a book for the moment. It's the book for the times that we're living in. Everybody should have a copy of this book. Please, everybody or at least every family, try and look for this book and go through it. Read chapter 33. Uh, it's entitled The First Great Deception. It's a powerful book to read. Read chapter 6, Escape from the Black Hole in the book Stronger Than He. It gives the same truths that we have studied, showing that Jesus is mightier than death. Also, you could read chapter 13 in the book Christ Our Surety. It gives us assurance that because Christ rose again, we too shall rise again. These are interesting books, interesting chapters to go through. If you'd like any of these books, please contact us and we will assist you in how to get, get yourselves copies. This is us from Third Angel Media and Pure Light Missions. Please contact us on the name, numbers and the emails given as well as the website indicated there. The Third Angel Media website is still under construction, but it shall soon be up by God's grace. Please follow us on social media, on Facebook and YouTube for further updates. Uh, like our page, uh, follow us on Facebook, uh, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel for you to constantly get uh, our updated lessons. May the good Lord bless you all. Amen.